Welcome to the Freedom Forum of Orange County on Wednesday, January the 5th, year 2005. And our guest speaker tonight is Bill Thornton of the Nitty Gritty Law School. Uh, it's not Harvard Law, it's not Stanford Law, it's not uh, Princeton Law, this is the Nitty Gritty Law School. We're going to give you the lowdown tonight, or I should say Bill Thornton will. And the Nitty Gritty Law School was founded a number of years ago by the late Bob Foster. And its mission is to peacefully encourage the government to obey the law. Now, that's a novel concept. The uh, school provides speakers and information to enable people throughout the courts to guide the government down the correct pathway to righteousness. I've witnessed a few court cases in the last half a year, and I don't see much righteousness in evidence. Um, it's a wonder to me the heavens don't part and they get struck by a lightning bolt. There's a number of people here tonight, I think, can attest to that, who have been run through the so-called uh, justice system. Anyway, um, his topic tonight is going to be why the Bill of Rights does not apply to citizens. Key word there is citizens, and I think Bill will explain what he means by that. And the importance of knowing the difference between a democracy and a republic. It never ceases to amaze me how these uh, people on the 6 o'clock news always refer to this country as a democracy. The, these uh, $6 million a year so-called anchor men and anchor women simply do not understand the difference. And I don't think they've got the IQ to understand it, most of them. And uh, I understand tonight, if I'm correct, that a free CD will be given to the uh, attendees here this evening, so you'll all get to go home with a freebie, and you can plug it in your Windows computer or whatever and play it back, and it's got over 18,000 files on it, and it's got all of titles 4, 18, 26, and 28. I guess that's the U.S. Code. 26, of course, has never been made into positive law and also the entire California code. Anyway, let's have a nice introduction here for uh, Bill Thornton of the Nitty Gritty Law School. Sounds a little dead. It was working a few seconds ago. <laughs> well, in the meantime, we'll get this going. Um, the first step that I want to do is to uh, go ahead and distribute the CDs. One, two, three, four, five. I, I guess it's okay. What, you're testing? One, two, three, four, five? It was working a while ago. There we go. Uh, I need to turn the volume up on it. I think it's working. So, anyhow, I have, uh, I made 25 of these things, but I suspect there's more than 25 of you there. Here, if, um, um, I'll trade this, well, let's put it this way. Those of you who did not get one, since apparently I haven't made enough, um, let me know, and I'll mail you one. Okay? Could you, could you distribute these for me, please? Thank you. And somebody want to distribute the other batch? Okay, thank you. So, and then I, if if this copied over I, as as uh, we were setting up, I went ahead and copied this. So we have another one here I can give you because now I can use the hard drive on the computer. But we'll see we'll see if this works first before we go to that. Okay. Um, let's see, law notes, and we'll go to there. No, I see. Okay. Already there's trouble. <laughs> That's how these things are.
Okay, there we go. Now we'll go to start. Run. Getting a lesson in computers here too. Computer, go to the D drive. And so C drive and law notes. And there it is. And so we will go to uh, where's the start? Okay, so basically what I'm doing is I'm going into the uh, folders and to start this up when it, it normally starts automatically when you put the CD in, but here I'm doing it from the hard drive because I copied it over and so I'm going to go over to the file that says start on it right here, double click on that and now click on OK and it started up. So now we have the, the full, this thing maximize it and there you are. So um, this is the CD that you get and um, the, um, let's see, here we go. Alright, now <clears throat> what I'll do is I'll click on Law Notes right here, it says Law Notes. And this is on the main page, and then uh, in the law notes, we'll go to foundation. And in the foundation, we have here uh, people or citizen, which one are you? Okay, so we'll click on that. And this comes up with an article about the difference between people and citizens. Now, Basically, what it is, is that uh, when this country was, we have a little feedback on this, I think. Just a little too much feedback on the mic. But when this country was founded, uh, it originally was, was uh, a bunch of revolutionaries broke away from England and the king canceled all the charters so that uh, uh, there basically was no connection between. All right, the volume, you're adjusting the volume, Dennis? Okay. So basically, there was no connection between the, uh, uh, the king, Great Britain, and ourselves anymore. Uh, as far as the king was concerned, he still owned everything. As far as we were concerned, he didn't. But there was no legal connection because the king revoked all the charters. And we made our own statement of independence. And at that point, there was no government, not legally, so everybody became a sovereign. Okay. Now there were some of us sovereigns who formed organizations that that were formerly called colonies and now were called states. Okay, and so these these organizations got together, and they they created this thing called the uh, uh, confederation. Okay, and uh, so they had the Articles of uh, Confederation, and that worked for a while, but then it really didn't work. So they sent, each of the states sent their emissaries to a big meeting and at that big meeting the emissaries uh, basically went off on a tangent and said well what we really need to do is just rewrite this whole thing. But this time instead of the states doing it, they did it as people. Still sovereign. And the theory they had was the Lockean theory that the, uh, you know, Locke was the uh, philosopher as opposed to Hobbes. Uh, Hobbes said power comes from the top and goes down to the people. Locke says power comes from the people and goes up to the top uh, to the government. And so our basic philosophy is Lockean. And um, they, uh, in the preamble, they basically said, we the people ordain and establish this constitution for you guys over there called the United States of America. So we're still acting with our sovereign powers and, and then what we said, if you read through the Constitution, toward the end it says that, okay, here's the game plan. And if nine of you organizations that call yourselves states will come on board with this plan, then it's a go. If we don't get nine of you at least, then it's a no-go. But the people put it together, proposed it, and said, okay, now you can volunteer into it, to the states. 
the, st the uh, states did volunteer into it. And so now uh, we had the United States of America. And uh, so they're, they're contracted in. There's actually court cases that, that recognize that the United States of America, as it's presently constituted, is by authority of the people and not by authority by the states. And the states are contracted in. And the people are still sovereign because it says we ordain and establish this constitution for whom? For the United States of America. Okay, well, when we ordain and establish, what does ordain and establish mean? Well, the ordain part means to authorize, to make law. The, the uh, <clears throat> establish means we actually put it on paper so you can read it, publish it, spread it around, create it. So we ordain and establish. Now, there's nothing about those two words, ordain and establish, that takes away from our sovereignty. We're still kings. Okay? Well, this is very painful to government. They couldn't stand that. So they had to figure a way. And don't, get, don't, don't uh, underestimate these people. These people um, think in 100-year terms or 200-year terms. Okay? And... One of the first signs of it, well, there are many first signs, of course, but one of the major first signs was when they took over the first uh, mandatory public school. You see, the first, you have to understand that when the United States broke away from England, we were a mature society. We were not just a bunch of colonists running around trying to figure out what to do. We had, we had education. We had knowledge here. We had people who were experienced and, and educated in history and and new stuff. Do you realize that in 1776, Harvard University, which was owned by a church, was over 100 years old? Okay? So we're not just a bunch of bushmen running around in the forest wondering what to do. And we put together a really excellent system. In fact, the more I study it, the more I see, boy, these guys were sharp. But no matter how sharp they were, they did miss one point. At that time, uh, and for many decades, all education pretty much was private. The parents got together, hired the teachers for their kids. They had local control. You've heard of local control for schools. Well, they really had real local control. They had real homeschooling. And uh, um, so in the 1850s, um, the government, I don't remember which city it was, but the government brought out the military and escorted the first children for the first mandatory public school. And that was the beginning of the public school system in the mandatory sense. There were public schools, but that was the mandatory public school. Now, why was it so important? Well, they couldn't change the Constitution. There was too much resistance there, so they changed the education system. From the 1850s to the 1950s, they stripped out the subject of civics and replaced it with a new subject that you're all pretty much familiar with. It's called American government. You ever take that in school? American government, social studies, okay? They took out civics. What is civics? Civics, if you look in the dictionary, at least the one I looked in, civics is the study of personal rights. It's that branch of political philosophy dealing with personal rights. Well, once the government gained control of the curriculum, they stripped out the things that were troublesome to government, things like your rights. So here we are again, okay, all of us basically are studying civics. That's really what we're doing when we go to court. Now, uh, so like I said, from the 1850s to the 1950s, they stripped it out. That subject is here, phased it out little by little. So from generation to generation, there might have been a deterioration, but it was not that visible what they were up to. But if you compare 100 years ago with today, or 150 years ago, you can see the difference, okay? Now, but that still wasn't enough because the people were sovereign. And um, uh, some people understood it, what it was. So they had, they had the uh, Civil War, and supposedly uh, it was over the issue of slavery. I can tell you the official reason for the Civil War the official reason I've actually seen with my own eyes. I saw the document that was signed by President Lincoln. It was on display at the Huntington Library 
It, it, it's, uh, that document is privately owned and they had it on display on loan to the library and I happened to go there when I heard that they had this, this uh, document. I wanted to see it so I can say I have actually seen it myself. You know what it was? Lincoln attacked the southern states for failure to pay their taxes. That's the legal reason, okay? Because you see, the federal government had to live off of the states. There was no income tax. So, and of course, that's pretty bad too, because you remember, money is power. And the states were able to keep the federal government under control pretty much uh, because they were the source of the money. And the federal government got, got quite desperate when a source of their income was going to try and leave. So they used force to keep them in the Union. So um, anyhow, they, uh, they had that little fiasco called the Civil War. And in 1868, they, again, using slavery as the, uh, as the excuse, they then came through with some amendments which supposedly helped to free the slaves. One of them, of course, was the 13th Amendment. I'm not talking about the lost 13th Amendment, but I'm talking about the other 13th Amendment where the phrase where I guess the slaves were freed up. But the real thing was the 14th Amendment because the 14th Amendment is the one that, that defined the term citizen of the United States. Now, you have... Um, You have two terms in the Constitution that are defined constitu constitutionally. One of them is treason, and the other is citizen of the United States. There are no other definitions in the Constitution. And the citizen of the United States, well, what is it? What does it take to be a citizen of the United States? Well, you have to qualify, okay? What are the two qualifications? That's what it names, two qualifications in order to be a citizen. The first qualification is, is you have to either be born here or naturalized. The second qualification to be a citizen of the United States is you have to be subject to the jurisdiction of the United States. See that word? Subject to the jurisdiction of the United States. That is the second requirement for being a citizen. You understand? Subject. The people are sovereign. They're not subject to anybody. At most, if you're one of the people of the United States, you are subject to your fellow sovereigns in the form of grand jury indictment and petite jury 100% conviction. Okay? That's a trial by the people, not a trial by the government. When a government does a prosecution, they prosecute on information. They appear with information before the magistrate, the magistrate functions like a one-man grand jury, decides whether or not there's a case there. And, of course, as we all know, he usually rubber stamps it to, to tell him, go ahead and do the prosecution. And then you have the next trial, which they say you can have a jury uh, if you're talking criminal proceedings. But, in fact, those juries are advisory juries. Okay? About the only place I know where common law might be really used is in an actual murder trial because they actually go and get an indictment. And in other words, to a grand jury, they don't do it on information, they do it on indictment. But then that's questionable too because none of the grand juries in the United States have 25 people. It's always fewer than 25. That's a whole subject area of discussion right there. As to, but basically, they typically have 21 or 23, but not 25. If they had 25, it would be a real grand jury. So it's a, it's a legislated, statutorily defined grand jury rather than a common law grand jury. If you want a common law grand jury, you get 25. I've kind of played with the thought of what if we got 25 of us together and officially noted, notified the government that we are a grand jury and then started investigating. What if we went to the court administrator and said, how about giving us a room we can meet in? <laughs> but again, that's another topic. But uh, if you do want to know about grand juries, read Article 61 of the Magna Carta, which is on this disc. And, the, and you'll see the entire procedure for setting up a grand jury and what the powers of a grand jury are. Anyhow, 
So the citizens are defined as people who are born or naturalized and subject to the jurisdiction. So if you're subject to the jurisdiction, now you're no longer sovereign. Okay, if you're subject to the jurisdiction, you have a master. After all, to be subject, you gotta have somebody who's subjecting you. Okay? So the preamble, let's look at this a little closer. Okay? We start off here. I kind of gave you the overview. Now here's the detail. The preamble does not specifically define the word people. Nevertheless, the definition becomes apparent in the context of the other words and prior history. And so prior to the United States, before the United States existed, there was no legal government, a group of representatives acting in the name and by the authority of the good people of these colonies, declared the independence of the colonies from the British crown and the state of Great Britain. And so from the beginning in the 1776 Declaration of Independence, the people were acknowledged as a source of authority, that is the sovereignty which authorized the Declaration of Independence. By the way, President Lincoln considered the Declaration of Independence as our first constitution. He said there were three constitutions and that was the first one. And some people are actually incorporating that in their, uh, in their legal papers saying that that's, that's the foundation that defines our system. Okay, so next came the Articles of Confederation in 1778, then 1787, the people themselves came forth to ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. And that's, that gave us a preamble. So here's, let's analyze that preamble because I want you to get a picture of this sovereignty. Okay, here's the full statement, we the people, of the United States in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure, so you have a laundry list of tasks. By the way, everything you see there, everything in there is an element of a trust. You've heard of trust? Okay. We have the people are the trustors. The, uh, the trustees are the United States of America. They, the purpose of the trust to establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, etc. Okay, and the beneficiaries of the trust are ourselves and our posterity. Okay, so the United States of America is not a country. It's the states that are independent, independent countries. It's the United States that that's a trust, a corporation. How can you tell it's a corporation? It's real easy. All corporations have presidents and vice presidents and secretaries and treasurers, okay? States have governors or countries have governors. Okay, so anyway, we go into the structure of this thing. Here it is, the trustor, we the people, the venue of the United States, the purpose in order to form a more perfect union, etc and get the blessings of liberty. The beneficiary to ourselves and our posterity, the enabling action, do ordain. We declare the law. Enabling action number two, and establish, bring into existence. What? This constitution. Those are the articles of incorporation for the trust. You know, all corporations are trusts. Are you aware of that? Yeah. You, you know, um, just as a side note, um, I've always advocated, uh, if you want to set up a trust, set up a corporation for profit or set up a non-profit corporation. To me, that's the best trust. Why is it the best trust? Because that's the trust that all the rich people use to protect their assets, their income, and get tax exemptions and the whole bit. And so, if you, the IRS is not going to attack that trust. That, if you did everything, if you put, did everything according to that trust, uh, you're basically pretty much immune from attack if you follow all the little rules. And the rules are designed so that the government gets no money. Okay? <laughs> you know? It's not an accident that they're set up that way. You can set up other trusts, and other trusts are legally correct and everything, but what did you do? You ran up a red flag on, you ran up the Jolly Roger on the, flagpole, right? He said, come get me. So you can be right 
and you can get a nice fight on your hands, maybe. I don't know. But just as a little aside, I like, I like uh, corporations and nonprofit corporations because of, of that. And I'm not taking away from the value of the other kinds of trusts. But if you really want to beat the system, that's how they all do it. That's why rich people don't pay taxes. What was it that... Uh, Leona Helmsley, that's right. She says only little people pay taxes. <laughs> okay. So anyway, so the, the um, trustee is the United States of America. And so here's the analysis here on this disc where it goes into that. It defines the context and in which the remainder of the Constitution must be interpreted. Most of it is self-explanatory. Here's an explanation that points to popular sovereignty. So you, you, but basically, the preamble, you see, when you talk to an attorney and you say, well, what's the significance of the preamble in the Constitution? And the answer I've always gotten was, well, there's really no legal significance, but it, it just kind of uh, is an introductory kind of thing, you know, but that's not part of the Constitution. And he's right from his point of view. Because the attorneys all deal with statutory law. They're all inside that shadow of the Constitution. Whereas the, uh, uh, the, the uh, preamble basically sets the foundation for what this is all about. We the people ordain and establish this system for you guys over there. This is how we want you guys to run this for our benefit. These are your operating rules. That Constitution was not written for you and me. It was written for them. And it doesn't apply to you and me. We're in our sovereign capacity. We can dump that anytime we want. Okay? So, and how do we dump it? Well, my favorite way to dump it is to go to court you know, and make them toe the line in court. You know, I mean, that's what I did one time. Went to court, and uh, the judge issued an order. I issued an order vacating his order. Later on, he forgot, and he issued a second order. So then I issued an order that vacated that second order. And I fined him for contempt of court. Okay? And by the way, on this CD that you've got, that case appears. And so you can look at it. It has, you look at the contempt ruling and you get the entire foundation of what, how that relationship between you and that judge is defined and why it is that you outrank that judge. Okay, it's all there. So anyway, um, the preamble sets the whole character of the game. And if you, in your sovereign capacity, choose not to play the game, that's your right. Okay? Because just think of it this way. If you uh, owned a company and you hired somebody and you said to that somebody, look, you're going to be the manager. I'm going to let you run the company and I'm going to be the janitor. <clears throat> now, when you take the job of janitor, and you're cleaning up around the company that you own. Is there anything to stop you from taking over the manager's job anytime you want to? <clears throat> Not at all. And so that's the relationship we have with the judge. When you own the country, then he works for you. And if he's not doing the job, you're entitled to order him right out. Okay? So, um, all right, after the Declaration of Independence, but before the ordainment and establishment of the Constitution, the people of the United States pretty much handled their own affairs using the common law. Now, everybody was educated in the common law, so that's what made it possible. Jefferson said that, to this effect, I'm paraphrasing, but he said that ignorance and liberty cannot coexist. So the United States of America or before it became the United States of America, when it was just colonies, was the biggest buyer of legal peerage. That's the nobility. Okay? Citizens are not peers. In fact, there was a case, I think I told you about this last time I was here, 
guy down in San Diego I heard about. He demanded a jury of his peers, and he knew what a peer was. The judge couldn't find one. Couldn't, could not find a single member, of, a potential member of the jury who would admit that he wasn't a citizen, okay, that he was a member of the sovereignty. And so uh, finally he sent the sheriff out to see if he could find some peers. Couldn't find them, had to report back. Eventually they had to dismiss the case because they couldn't assemble a proper jury. <laughs> I wish I met that guy. I wish I knew who he was. I'd like to talk to him more. I just got that second hand. I never forgot that story. So, <clears throat> all right, so here's a court case in Lansing versus Smith that occurred in New York. And by the way, on these sites here, you'll see where it says uh, Lansing v. Smith for Wend, okay, short for Wendell. Uh, basically, page nine, volume four, page nine. What that is, is that back in the early days of our court system, the uh, court records were the personal records of the clerk. And uh, they, a lot of these records got lost because, you know, there were personal records, they were in their homes and things happened. So the, uh, uh, when they cite those old cases, they cite the clerk's name. And it's, so it's volume four of Wendell, page nine. And the year was 1829. Okay, and uh, so anyway, in that case, the, uh, the court said, the people of this state, as the successors of its former sovereign, are entitled to all the rights which formerly belonged to the king by his prerogative. By his prerogative. What are your rights? Well, it's whatever you say they are. Okay? Your only limitation on your rights is that you may not impose your will on another sovereign, okay? You can contract with another sovereign, but you can't impose your will on them. And so your rights stop where mine start, okay? There's an invisible border between us that we have to respect. Of course, if we get into a dispute about it, that's what the court process is all about. But basically, um, this is the important concept that all the rights which formerly belonged to the king by his prerogative, he determined, you want to know what the king's rights were or are? He'll tell you. You just ask him. Those are my rights. So if I want to drive down the left side of the street, that's my prerogative. I call that a right. But, you see, we, we have, at least you've heard it advertised, we have this principle that you're innocent until proven guilty. And what's the basis? The basis is, did you harm someone? Okay? If you have no corpus delicti, if there's no body of the crime, then there's no, no basis for prosecution. Okay? You're presumed innocent. If nothing went wrong, you must have had things under control. But if you screw up, then the penalties are very severe. Um, did you know that for example, first-time burglary is, what, 30 days? Isn't that what it is in, under the uh, statutory laws, the codes, penal code? Something like that, 30 days for a minor burglary. Under common law, it's a death penalty. If you've ever been burglarized, I'm sure you felt like killing whoever did it. You know? So the... Uh, uh, the statutes are rather kind to criminals. But the, the thing is, is that the rights are by your prerogative, whatever they are. Now let's compare that with citizenship. A citizen is subject, okay? Here we are, we get into the definition of citizen of the United States. It's the 14th Amendment. Um, before ratification of the Amendment 14, there was no legal definition of the term citizen of the United States. The term was used, but only generally. It was not a legal term. It was a conversational term. Okay? After the Civil War, the slaves were freed, but there was no legal basis to recognize them as being, uh, of having any rights. Amendment 14 partially solved that problem. If you're a citizen of the United States, 
which all the slaves were, then this constitutional amendment imposed on the states the requirement that they must accept that person as a citizen of that state if he's living there. Okay? That's how they, because there was no legal basis from the state's point of view for recognizing these slaves that were now freed because they, they came from out of the country. Even if they were born here, they were from out of the country. So to get them accepted. But look what happened. What happened was that the slaves were privately owned and they got released into what amounted to public ownership. Right? Citizens of the United States, they're subject to the jurisdiction. They are now publicly owned. But what a neat deal. Isn't it nice to have slaves for whom you are not responsible to feed them? You're not responsible to clothe them. You're not responsible to house them. And yet you have control of them. Now, white people uh, were not slaves, generally. There were white slaves, by the way. Don't get me wrong on that one. But generally, the people of the United States were not slaves. They were sovereign in their capacity. So now the thing is, is over the decades from the 1850s to the 1950s, as they redid the curriculum and they pulled all that information out, what did they do? They transferred the people out of the capacity of people and into the capacity of citizen of the United States. That's what they taught you in the schools. So that now they're wrapping the whole population up as one great big supply of slaves. Okay? Public ownership. So, let's see. Here we go. Free the slave was the rallying cry combined with the Civil War that resulted in the Amendment 14. Amendment 14 created a new class of person called citizen of the United States. Any ex-slave could now claim citizenship. And by the way, so could any of the people if they chose to do so. Amendment 14 made possible the voluntary relinquishment, relinquishment of personal sovereignty. So, notice this. Now, to qualify for citizenship, you have to be born or naturalized and subject to the jurisdiction. If you meet that qualification, you are now a citizen of the United States. But look what they do now. They don't tell you that part of it. They don't teach you that in the schools. What they do teach you is they teach you to say you are a citizen of the United States. Pick anybody walking down the street and ask them, are you a citizen of the United States? And assuming he is, he will say yes, you know, not knowing that there's another class of human being in this country. So as a citizen of the United States, uh, if you say you're a citizen of the United States, what are you saying? You're saying, I'm your subject. I'm subject to you, the government, or the United States, right? So that's the deal get you to say you're a citizen of the United States. When you, when, if you look at the criminal proceedings these days, you look at those charges that they put together and they file with the courts, you'll see a couple of things on there. One of them is what? Social security number, right? And the other thing you see on there is driver's license number, if you have one, or identification number, you know, the same system, okay? What are they doing? They're identifying you as a citizen of the United States. You're subject. You're a publicly owned slave. And the judge, if you read the codes, if you look in the codes, it tells you right in there, in the California codes particularly, that strict interpretation as required by common law does not apply here. That the code shall be interpreted so as to effect justice. Justice in whose opinion? Right? There is the key to the judge's discretion because he's going to try and effect justice as he sees it or as the policies of the state dictate it. So they carry out justice. And have you ever noticed the justice you get? Okay, well, anyhow, um, so we, Amendment 14 is the key, okay? 
And here it, it says it right here. Uh, all persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state where they reside. Okay? There it is, right in the Constitution. Hmm? Yes, that's right. Dual citizenship. You're a citizen of the state. You're a citizen of the United States. They're de-emphasizing that. They've divided the... Uh, I, I've heard that uh, the way they divided it was that the intent was to have uh, an equal distribution of the population. Same number of people in each section. So the first digit of your zip code designates which one of the ten districts you're in. And what the ultimate plan, of course, is to phase out the states and have just these nine districts of the United States. So are you a citizen of the United States? Sometimes. Are you a citizen Sometimes. of the United States? Sometimes. Sometimes. Yes, you see, here's the interesting thing, is that as a people, I'm in my sovereign capacity. As the owner of the business, if I choose, I can take a job as a janitor in my own business and let the manager tell me what to do if I choose. But maybe I choose not and say, hey, I quit. I've decided not to be a janitor anymore. I'm going back to ownership. I can do that anytime I want if I own the business, right? So when you're in your sovereign capacity, you can pick and choose when you want to be a citizen. So you can be a citizen for some purposes and not a citizen for other purposes. And I do that. I'm going to be right at the trough collecting my social you security. Vote? Yep. You do, you for that purpose, I'm a citizen of the United States. Let me show you that. Let me, let me show you the court case that backs me up on that. Okay? Let's go to uh, sovereignty. All right? And let's see if I can find it. Fast way. There it is. Okay. Well, <clears throat> messed up there. Let's go back up to the top. Okay. Now, there was a case where this Indian tribe, which is a sovereign nation, even though it's a conquered nation, the United States recognizes their sovereignty and lets them run their own affairs to some degree. And this Indian tribe went into a contract with um, a corporation where the corporation would bring in the equipment and mine a bunch of minerals out of the land and, and cart it off the land. And it was a partnership between the Indian tribe and the corporation, and they would split the profits. Okay, had some formula for splitting it. So after the, all the equipment was installed and they had this going operation and the portions of the land were going out through the Indian gate, the Indian council had a meeting, and remember, they're sovereign, and he said, you know, we need to lay on to this an extraction tax. So they're going to tax everything that's taken out of the land. Well, the company screamed to high heaven on that one, and it ended up in the Supreme Court. And this is what the Supreme Court said. It said, starting here, it is one thing to find that the tribe has agreed to sell the right to use the land and take valuable minerals from it and quite another to find that the tribe has abandoned its sovereign powers simply because it has not expressly reserved them through a contract. To presume that a sovereign forever waives the right to exercise one of its powers unless it expressly reserves the right to exercise that power in a commercial agreement turns the concept of sovereignty on its head. Just because you sign a contract and you fail to reserve your sovereignty does not mean you gave it up. That's what they're saying here. You can pick and choose. If you choose to give up your sovereignty, as they did in the beginning, that's fine. But hey, 
you know, I mean, they are a government, and it's true they're a partner, but also, you know, they got a tax, right? Since they're a government. <laughs> that was the Indian point of view. So this case basically says that you and I are sovereigns, and we can pick and choose. When we want to be a sovereign, we can go into contracts. So absolutely, yes. I go in, and in one case, I mean, you know, I have all the trappings of citizenship where I allow it to be. But when push came to shove and I got involved in a case, I started issuing orders in court and I never got questioned. Never had a single order ever challenged. That's an interesting thing, too. Because what I do is when I issue an order, <coughs> I almost always also accompany it with an order to show cause. Show me why I'm wrong, okay? You have 30 days in which to file a paper saying why this order I just issued is incorrect. I have never had a single opposition paper filed, ever. Interesting. I've had them dance around my orders, you know? So anyway. So the thing is, is you can pick and choose when and where you want to be a sovereign. Okay, well, see, citizens are subjects. And citizens have privileges granted by the master. They have no rights. If you're going to be a citizen, if you're a 100% citizen, then you are 100% subject. If you're a part-time citizen, then you can step out of that role anytime you want. Now, what's the difference between people and citizens, like in my case? The difference is education, knowledge. If you say you are one of the people, you're one of the people. The burden is on them to prove you're not. You see, when you accuse yourself, you don't have to prove it to anybody. It's when somebody else accuses you that they have to come up with the proof. See. Any claim you make about yourself, you don't have to prove it. The burden's on the other side. Whoever makes a claim against you, they have to prove whatever their claim is. So I claim I'm a sovereign. What is a sovereign? What, is, what are people? To tell you the truth, I can't tell you what a people is. I know I'm one of them, but I can't tell you what people are or is. By the way, that word is correct, either singular or plural. So what is a people? Well, like I said, I can't tell you, but I'll tell you what I can tell you. I know the relationship between people and government. We the people, whoever, whatever we are, ordain and establish it for you guys, and so you're under us. So if anybody asks me, if, oh, you're, says you're a people, what's that? I'll say, I don't know, <laughs> but I know I'm above you, the government. Okay, because that's, they defined our relationship without defining what we were. Yes, sir. How does all this apply to foreign immigrants? Or, well, I mean, immigrants from outside the United States of America. Well, um, that's an interesting question. Um, I've never really, really researched that. But um, I suspect that an immigrant who comes here, if he's naturalized and subject to the laws, subject to the jurisdiction of the United States, then that person would be a publicly owned slave. Right? A citizen. Now, can you break that yoke? Because what they do is they contract you in. When you take the oath of allegiance in order to acquire citizenship, I think they tell you, well, you, do you promise to obey all the laws and this sort of thing? So you actually have a contract. They didn't miss that point. Uh, I suspect you could break the contract, but I don't know how. Now, one person I know, he's researched it, and he says that you have to be of the land. And he claims you cannot move your sovereignty, whatever state you were born in. Now, I don't know that I necessarily agree with that. But to tell you the truth, I've, de I've never researched the immigrant question. But I'll tell you this. If the country that you came from is a republic, then it's the same system we have here. Okay? Because the very definition, which is what we're going to get into next, the very definition of a republic involves personal sovereignty, okay? So... This is very interesting because most countries in this world 
our republics. Poland sounds republics. Yes. But I don't think Red China is a republic. Yes, it is. I know for, it is? Mm -hmm. There are republics. But a republic is at once the best form of government for the most freedom and the worst form of government for enslaving people. What makes it the best? Everybody's educated and knows the difference and choose to be people. What makes it the worst? The people don't know the difference and they allow themselves to be citizens and they get abused, which is how, what you do with citizens. They're just property. Okay? If you don't know the difference, how can you break out of the citizenship shell? So uh, the Ayatollah Khomeini, you remember him? He chose the Republican form of government for his organization for, over there. Well, because those people who knew the difference, the educated populace, they knew the difference and they chose to be people. That way the laws that were passed didn't apply to them. And yet they could send their, their policemen out to beat up on the citizens when, this, when they felt necessary. So a, uh, a republic is a, uh, a wonderful form of government if everybody's educated in it. It's a terrible form of government if you're ignorant. Okay. All right, so let's see. Um, that's basically, uh, now let's get into the, the point of this. What I'm really, the whole reason for bringing this up is I wanted to explain to you the difference between people and citizens. And the subject, what I wanted to want to tell you tonight is why it is if you're a citizen you have no rights. And I think you kind of got an idea now from what I've told you that a citizen doesn't have any rights because why? He's subject. He's given up all that. It, what he gets is privileges. When you talk about uh, civil rights, if you really speak the language correctly, those are called civil privileges. Okay? Natural rights is what people have. Civil rights, also known as civil privileges, is what citizens have. So all these citizens running around demanding their civil rights, what are they saying? What they're saying is, is that certain privileges have been legislated for our benefit, or maybe for our control, and we demand that those civil rights be acknowledged. You won't catch me suing for my civil rights. I'll be suing for my natural rights. Yes. And what are civil liberties? Same idea. Same idea, that's your civil rights, civil privileges again. It's civil. It's the civil aspect it says it's government granted. We're not part of the government when we're people, we're above the government. Okay? Sovereignty. Scary thought, isn't it? So, let's go to the Bill of Rights here. Okay? Now, there's a book called It's called the Constitution of the United States of America, Analysis and Interpretation. That's the full name of the book. And I've got a copy of it on this CD so you can read it. And it's about 2,700 pages. As you can tell, there's a lot on the CD. A quarter of a million bytes, more than that, on there of information. And that's one of the things that I included on it, is the entire book. But on this here, where I went to uh, people's rights versus citizens' rights, I, I extracted from that book this particular thing because I thought it was particularly interesting to our discussion here. And here it is. This, is, this book, by the way, is published by the Senate. Every senator, every congressman, and the vice president of the United States gets a free copy when they come into office. Why doesn't the president get a copy? The reason is is because he's not part of the Congress. The vice president is the president of the Senate. That's why he gets his free copy. So they all get this. This is, you might loosely call, the book of truth. This is, somebody's got to know how this system's put together. Somebody's got to keep this running right. So they published this book, which many congressmen don't even open. A friend of mine went up to uh, his congressman's office over somewhere near Monrovia, I think it is. He went out, he saw it sitting on the shelf, brand new. 
brand new, never opened, never touched, except to put it on the shelf. But here we are. If you look on Senate document 99-16, which is the official designation for this book, on page 956 through 957, you look at footnote 12. Footnote 12 clarifies the text that's in there. And here's what footnote 12 says. I've kind of laid it out. On the left side, you have amendments that are available to U.S. citizens. We're talking about the Bill of Rights, the first 10 amendments. Okay? And on the right, we have amendments not available to U.S. citizens. So, you have a privilege, actually, if I speak correct English, you have a pr privilege of free exercise and establishment of religion, protection on that. You have freedom of speech, freedom of press, freedom of assembly, and freedom to petition the government. Those are such strong rights for people that when they converted people into citizens, they didn't dare take them away. I mean, there might be another revolution if they did. So they, they've granted those privileges. You have uh, uh, supposedly Fourth Amendment privileges, freedom from search, unreasonable search and seizure, uh, freedom from double jeopardy, self-incrimination, and just compensation for property that they take from you. You know, eminent domain? You know, where the government says, oh, we want your property. And uh, finally, let's see, on the sixth, sixth and Eighth Amendments, these protections have been somewhat diluted. Speedy trial, public trial, jury trial, impartial jury, notice of charges, confrontation of witnesses, uh, compulsory process in order to get your witnesses, and a right to counsel. Those are, they somewhat diluted it, but there it is. I believe if you are considered an enemy combatant, you don't have any right even to see an attorney. You know, that's what all those guys they captured. Yes, sir. Bill, could you uh, read that reference one more time? Uh, this is on the disc, of course, and uh, where you look at uh, people's rights versus citizens' rights. I can go through the, uh, the chain here. Okay, you're on the home page and you go to the law notes. You click on law notes. This is, when I say the home page, I'm talking about the very first page that pops up when you put the CD in your computer. So you go to law notes. In the law notes, you click on the foundation. And then in the foundation, you click on people or citizen. No, I'm sorry, Bill of Rights. You click on Bill of Rights under the foundation category. And when you click on the Bill of Rights, it brings up that page there. And there is where you have it identified as Senate Document 99-16, pages 956 and 957. Okay. So these are the privileges that citizens have or don't have. Okay. Now let's look at the privileges that citizens do not have. And by the way, these are all have a history of court determination. This book cites the cases for that, that support the, the uh, interpretation that's being made. So let's look at these rights that you don't have. In other words, privileges that are not granted to citizens. You do not have a right to keep and bear arms. That should touch uh, some hot points here with some people. If you're a people, you have a right. In fact, you have all rights. What are your rights? Whatever you say they are, as long as you don't hurt another one of the people, one of the sovereigns. But as a citizen, you don't have a right. Why don't you? Because you're subject. If you're subject, you've got to obey the rules that you're given. Under the common law, we have one rule. Don't hurt anybody. The golden rule. Treat others as you'd have them treat you. You've all heard that golden rule, right? That's the found Christianity. The Christian Bible is the foundation of the American system of law. Okay? And that goes back further. The Christian system of law is based on the Judaic system of law. So, regardless of your belief, our legal system was extracted from those systems. So, but 
you see, as a citizen, all you have is privileges. Okay? And uh, the, we'll come back to the Third Amendment, but the Fifth Amendment, grand jury indictment. You do not have a right to a grand jury indictment. That's why they're processing all these things under information. When they bring a charge against somebody, it's on information rather than on indictment. Okay? Indictment means you go through a grand jury. Information means the prosecutor said, hey, I got information. This guy's a bad guy. Takes it before the magistrate. Magistrate rubber stamps it and says, yeah, I better prosecute him. Whereas the grand jury, if it's properly functioning, which a lot of them are not, the grand jury says, hmm, let's look at this. You know? Nah, we're not going to let you prosecute. We don't care what the law says. You can't prosecute. That's the whole concept of the grand jury. You hand it over to the people. You see, the power comes from the people to the government through the representatives. And then the power gets executed where the rubber meets the road, the application. Where does it get reviewed? Is the government really carrying out the wishes of the people? That's why you have grand juries. Government comes back and says, hey, he violated this law. And the grand jury says, we don't care. You can't prosecute. Or you do prosecute. Yes, sir. Well, I haven't worked out the details on that one, but that's, that's one of the things I'd like to do when I get freed up and I can actually put on a seminar once a month and, and then start doing it. There's a lot of stuff. It's very fertile, things that we're all interested in. But I'll say this much. If you look at Article 61, Article 61 basically says that the, uh, the grand jury elects itself. There are no rules for how it gets elected. Okay, this is totally the discretion of the self-elected grand jurors. So they could volunteer. Well, like I said, there's no rules. Okay, when you assemble 25 people and they've elected themselves by whatever method they choose, that's the grand jury. But of course, if you camp out at McDonald's and have a discussion, uh, that doesn't earn you many much image points, okay? So my suggestion is if anybody does do a grand jury, they should go over to the court administrator and say, we're a grand jury, and uh, give us a room. And you do it right in their buildings, okay? And that, that, would, be, that, that would give you the credibility, see? Yes? What you say is correct, that theoretically, at least, the accused can bring his own grand jury. Who? The accused. The, the, the accused can bring his own grand jury, but of course he, the accused is not part of the grand jury. That's He's fine. the accused. But That's sure, fine. sure, if he can round up 25 friends. In fact, there was a case one time where this guy, uh, he was in court, and his friends all got together, and they showed up in court, and the judge did something. I don't know what he did, whatever he did. It was right at the end of the case. And all of his friends stood up, and, and simultaneously they all said, we accuse you of treason. And later on, the, the sheriff that was there, apparently he was educated in this, and he said to one of the people, he said, you know, he said, if there had been 25 of you, I would have had to arrest the judge. <laughs> there weren't 25 there, so it was just a crowd making a noise. But isn't that an interesting thought? So we've got to work out some details here, you know. But I, I see a very powerful concept. I'll tell you what, one thing that is true, I cannot tell you specifically which uh, government code section it is, but I know it exists. And, it, and I do have the government code on this CD if somebody wants to go looking for it. But any grand jury can remove any officer from his office, even if he's elected. Yes, sir. And do you think the branch can't, the grand jury has jurisdiction over the judges of the branch and the superior court? Oh, yeah, I think so. Yeah. But, you know, they're statutory, so there's some questions there. You know, a, a real grand jury, absolutely yes. But uh, uh, a statutory grand jury, I don't know what their limits are yes, because they're statutory.
Okay, great. Well, sounds like they do then, if that's what it says. I guess it's in the government code, right? Well, yeah, look, when, when you ask the grand jury to investigate something, and then you have the uh, district attorney with a desk right in the same room advising them because he's their advisor, and he's telling them, oh, well, your jurisdiction here or not there, you know, and he's lying to them. They don't know, and they do that all the time. And if you can ever get inside a grand jury, you can demand that he leave because the proceedings are supposed to be secret, even from the government, okay? The members of the what? Of the Republic to set up a new grand jury for a country. What is our difference? Well, again, are you one of the people or are you one of the citizens? If you're one of the people, then you just get together, 25 of you, makes a grand jury. Read Article 61 of the Magna Carta. Okay? I mean, that, that's, where the that's where the answers to your question are. The Magna Carta was written in India for India. Yes. The Magna, Carta, the Magna Carta is good law. The Magna Carta, if you look on the disc, look up the Confirmatio Catarum, which, which King Edward I certified the Magna Carta as the common law. Okay? No, no. We adopted the common law for this country. The Constitution of the United States recognizes the common law of England. So it's good law. In 1789, when it was ratified. Yes, sir. So, at the end of the meeting tonight, I'd recommend that we form a citizen's grand jury, I'm sorry, a people's grand jury, and do some investigating of some things happening here in the county, as well as the proceedings being committed by our members of Congress. Well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it at this point because I think there's not enough education among us. Even, I mean, I don't even know all the, all the game plan. You know, we just, uh, I would say uh, step one is education. Step two is action, all right? If you try to do action first, all you do is you get your, your tail in a ringer. So I would not form a grand jury on a whim, all right? I think it's a very serious thing to form a grand jury. You have a tremendous amount of power. And I'll tell you what, they will fight back and they will take advantage of your ignorance. So you better. I don't think so. Because, yeah. 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 All I, I know is. Sure. And one more question. Okay. Right. Short one? Can a judge in line by telling them to give an instruction to a jury, or should a jury make up their own mind on everything? The, que the question is, is the judge in line when he gives instructions to a jury, or should what? The, the or, jury... Or should the jury... The jury be independent. Investigation and whatever it may, may take them. Right. Uh, well, that, that depends on whether you have a fully empowered jury or if you have an advisory jury. Most of your juries, in fact, all of your juries these days are advisory juries. Therefore, yes, the judge can instruct them. So, but that's a whole subject area. That's a different subject area than what we're talking about tonight. But basically, you have to figure out which kind of a jury you're in first. So anyway, going back to this, you see on the left side, and this is according to the top book that they have in the Congress that they publish, there's the privileges that citizens have on the right, on the left, and on the right side are the privileges they do not have, that they're prohibited, okay? Now, the whole gun issue is a hot issue, so they're a little light on, on taking guns away from citizens. Not that they're not working on it, but you see. Um, but that's basically where it divides the two. All right, now there's a difference between people and citizens, as you, you now know. Got to get back on track here. So, the next thing is uh, the difference between 
a democracy and a republic. So let's, let's go back there as we've covered. Is everybody clear on citizen and people at this point? Have I adequately? Everybody's satisfied, okay. All right, let's go back now. Let's talk about um, uh, a uh, democracy versus a republic. Now the best way to explain a republic is to first explain a democracy. Okay, republic versus democracy is, is where we are on the second page. And a democracy, a pure democracy is very easily defined. 51 beats 49. That's simple. 51 beats 49. Majority rule. Majority rule, right? And you hear this word democracy thrown around a lot, okay? Every politician uses it, every newspaper uses it. When do you ever hear the word republic other than when you're saying the, uh, the uh, Pledge, of Pledge of Allegiance, right? Never, right? They don't like that word, republic. And, uh, but you see, and the Democrats, they're called Democrats because they favor democracy. And the Republicans are called Republicans because they favor a republic. At least historically, that's been true. So what is a democracy? It's 51 beats 49. Now, at first, it sounds like, you know, that's a good idea. You know, let's get together, argue out the issues, and then let's vote on it, and let's see, you know, we come to a solution, and whatever the majority wants, that's what you get. But what a democracy really is, a democracy is a dictatorship of the majority. The minority have no rights. Whatever the majority says, it's mandatory on the minority. Okay? Now, in a democracy, uh, as I said, it's mandatory. Okay? There's no choice. In a democracy, the sovereignty of the state is in the entire body of the citizens. Okay? When the citizens vote on an issue, whatever they say is mandatory. The government must obey it and everybody else subject to it must obey it. The sovereignty is in the entire group. The individual members of that group have no sovereignty. Sure, they vote. For a moment, they have an exercise of sovereignty. They cast the vote, but whatever the outcome is, everybody's subject to it. No choice. Okay? That's a democracy. Now, in a republic, in a republic, everybody's sovereign. You see, a democracy and a republic are identical. You have representatives, you have voting. Everything is exactly the same, excepting for one little detail. And that's the placement of the sovereignty. With a democracy, the sovereignty is in the entire body, the body acting as a unit, the body politic. In a republic, the sovereignty is in each individual person, okay? Now, if you're sovereign, if you're sovereign, and you're sovereign, and I'm sovereign, we're all equal, aren't we? I have nothing on you, and you have nothing on me. The only time you have anything on me is when I injure you. If I injure you, you're entitled to your compensation, not profit but compensation for your loss, whatever you lost. And if there's an argument about what you lost, we can go to a jury and have them figure it out. But basically, in a republic where we're all sovereigns, we're all equal. Now, when an issue comes up for argument, it works just like in a democracy. We all argue back and forth, and then we vote on it. And when we vote on it, we now have a conclusion. But in a republic, Whatever that conclusion is, we do not allow the group to take over the individual sovereign. If it could, you wouldn't be sovereign. You'd have a democracy. So if we're all sovereigns, and if we can't, don't let the group take over, what does that say? What that says is that whatever the group decides, that decision is advisory, not mandatory. 
See, in a democracy, it's mandatory. In a republic, it's advisory. All the laws are advisory. You can say, shove off. I don't like your way of doing things. I'm innocent until proven guilty. Now, in, we, under, we acknowledge that uh, in our system, in the design of our system, we acknowledge that nothing's perfect. Okay? The Greeks, when they formed a jury, it consisted of a thousand members. Their theory was that nobody was rich enough to bribe all thousand members. Okay? So that, that was their attempt to assure an honest jury. For some reason, I can't explain why, in our system, our modern system, modern mean, meaning the last 800 years or so, uh, we said 12 is a good sized jury. If you can get 12 people to agree, then hmm, maybe you got something here. So 12 people say you're guilty. Each person on that jury represents one twelfth of society. If 100% of society is against you, now the rule becomes mandatory on you. Okay? What's the job of the jury? Well, one of the things is, as you all know, to judge the facts. Hang them right, he says. The second job of a jury, which really is the first job, is to judge the law. Okay? So, as a sovereign, I decree what the law is. And then I accuse and I try to subject somebody to my law. I'm claiming an injury. You violated my law and that's an injury to me. So we call in a jury and the jury judges whether or not my law is reasonable. I guess I've told you about my pink shoe law. Everybody here familiar with my allergy against pink shoes? Well, anybody here wearing pink shoes? I don't see any. See, I can't stand pink shoes. I'm really offended. It upsets me. Uh, it burns the retinas of my eyes. Okay? I cannot deal with pink shoes. And this is such a serious, I take this so seriously that I attach a death penalty to anybody who violates my law against pink, pink shoes. Okay? Now, if you should happen to wear pink shoes, I'm going to start proceedings against you. All right? Now, I'll kind of shortcut that story by asking you, what's the probability of finding a jury that will agree with my law? Now, most people tell me it ain't too high. <laughs> okay? But now let's pick another example. I also am very opposed to somebody, let's say I'm walking down the street. I'm minding my own business, and somebody comes up from behind me, unprovoked, a stranger, never saw him before in my life, and he slugs me a good one and knocks me out. Okay? No permanent injuries, but did assault me. My law in that situation is that that person, he violated my person, and he should go to jail for at least 30 days. And I bring charges against him. He's going to jail for 30 days for not that unprovoked attack. What's the probability that I would find a jury that would agree? I'd say it's pretty good, isn't it? You see? So this is the foundation of the American system, the common law. Custom and usage is what it is. By our customs and usage, uh, we're not opposed to pink shoes, but by our custom and usage, we are opposed to unprovoked assaults. Okay? And the jury, which have sometimes been described as the representative of God, the jury, in their heart, in their hearts, each member knows what's good and what's evil. And in their hearts, they probably know, despite my attachment to this rule, they know that it's not evil to wear pink shoes. Okay? And in their hearts, they know it is evil to do unprovoked attacks on strangers. So this is the foundation of our system. You can charge anybody with any violation, but you have to decree what the law is, and you have to say what the facts were that violated that law, and then the defense has the ability to call in a jury to defend himself, 
And that jury judges the validity of that law and judges whether or not the facts violated the law. Okay? That, in a simple way, describes our system. So um, we're a republic. And as a republic, we're all sovereigns individually. And the laws are advisory unless you can get 100% of the jury to enforce it. And with an educated public, educated peers, members of the peerage, right? Because you're sovereign. With educated peerage, this system would work pretty good, wouldn't it? Because frankly, I do trust a jury if I can get all the information to them. And either way, whether I'm a plaintiff or a defendant, I'll trust a jury. That the, I will trust, I would take a chance on the random error of a jury before I would take a chance on the designed in error based on precedent that we would get from a judge. See, juries are not bound by precedent. Judges are. Judges are bound by statutes. Juries are not. Okay? So, does that make sense now? You see, you see the difference between... Well, that, that, uh, Republic follow the Constitution and a democracy just the uh, uh, majority rule is that the difference? Why don't you repeat that? <laughs> My understanding is that uh, Republic follows the Constitution and a democracy is strictly, like you say, uh, majority rule. Uh, would that be a difference? Well, the majority, the majority rules, always rules, but the difference is, is that in one case the ruling is advisory, whereas in the other the ruling is uh, mandatory. Now, what do you mean? The Constitution is advisory? Is that what you're trying to say? As a matter of fact, it is advisory as far as we're concerned. It's mandatory as far as the government is concerned. Those people who take an oath to support the laws of the United States, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? It's mandatory on them. They have to. They have no choice. They do. They file it every day. So what, uh, what we well, do? then that's what you have courts for. Go ahead and they sue them. You? That's what we have courts for. That's why you sue them. Okay? That's what you do. You sue them. Okay. I think the main mic needs a little uh, volume control assistance there. Go ahead and talk. Got the mic there? Go ahead and talk. Talk in the mic. What? Well, can't you, um, can't you, don't you have a gain control on the mic? Turn it all the way down and bring it up slowly. Okay, there we go. Is it possible for a country, a state, same thing, right, to combine both systems, to be a democracy and a republic? That is exactly what we're doing. We have one system for the people and we have another system for the citizens. Okay. Okay, the system that's for the people is called common law. The system for the citizens is called statutory law. If you wish to participate as a citizen, if you want to go to work for your own self, to use the business example, you can do that. So, I have a driver's license. I have social security. Okay? Yes. Not there, a, uh, is this on? Yes, but it, the volume's down on this one. So, you see, if you... Uh, Where's Dennis? Okay, well anyway, the, um, um, 
Yeah, you have two systems. You have the common law for the people, and you have the statutory law for the citizen. Okay? So, the, uh, uh, to answer your question, yes, you have two systems. Mm -hmm. The Roman civil law is great. I, I didn't expect that answer. I was thinking of a country, a former country, that was called the German Democratic Republic. Remember that? Yeah. East Germany? Former right. East Germany? But, of course, there were no sovereigns there. It was communist. Well, the, the, a lot of things changed over there uh, well, from the original. It's free now. So, okay. Yes, uh, pass that on to the next person. That, that volume control needs some attention there. Okay. Uh, well, that basically summarizes. Are there any questions or did I leave any point unanswered for you? Yes. You're for the microphone. No. Here you are. If you are one of the people, uh, is there a way that you can vouch for a citizen to make them one of the people? No, or you don't vouch for it. If, if, not vouch, if, I, if I need your sovereign authority in order to have my sovereignty, then I'm not a sovereign. I'm your subject. Okay? <laughs> that, that's what that... No, I, I need to... Does that make sense? So, so if you're a citizen then you're, and you're you want... Uh, yeah. Then you have no rights. That's really. correct. You're subject. And, but uh, I was thinking if... Now... We the people, they have, they have more. They, they have self-defined rights. They have self-defined rights. So, right. uh, if they say that they mm -hmm. couldn't, they uh, help someone else. Who well, is you're not welcome a to help somebody, but but then, uh, why would you want to? Well, I mean, are you building your own country? No. Well, say if are you, you you want your own subjects? Is that what say you're saying? Say if you had a friend who was not. A sovereign. I tell them to become a sovereign. Education, that's why I'm here tonight. I'm saying this is what you got to do. Okay? If you are always well, if going you're to. If you're born in another country. Or if you're and you born in here, another country and you come here. And I haven't researched that out. Okay. I don't know. So I can't say what that is uh, because I haven't researched it. But I suspect that. At least if you come from a place that's a republic, if you're sovereign there, at the very least, you'd be a visiting sovereign here. Okay? At the very least. Yes, sir. Here you go. Now, I do want to tie this into the court procedure, because that's what I promised. Uh, then you could use the common law as a common thread between countries. Well, you, you can... You, yeah, you could in that, but I wouldn't use it as a common thread between countries. I just simply say, "Hey, I'm king, and I'm visiting." Okay. <laughs> you know. <laughs> well, now let me let me tell you what happens in court. When I uh, when I go to court, I construct my papers very very simply on this point. So let's let's show you the actual example of how it's done. We go to uh, the, law, the example right here. We're on the home page of the CD again. And we click on the example. And then, on this example, we have an action for trespass. In other words, a lawsuit. Now, this particular here example right here, you should ignore because I just put it there so that you can see how it all started. But it was not a good example. And in fact, when you go there, I warn you, warning, do not use this action as a model. It has errors and so forth. But it's there for the historical benefit. But let's go back to the first amended action, okay? Because that's where we were. The first amended action right here. This is a properly done action, and this is the one you can look at as an example. In the first amended action, we have, of course, individual paragraphs. And the very first paragraph basically says that this first amended action amends by entire substitution the action filed before. Okay? So all we're saying is get rid of the original action, 
this is the real action now. All right? So if that first paragraph were not there, then paragraph two would become paragraph one. Okay? And here's what paragraph one says. It says, William Jones, here and after plaintiff, is one of the people of California, and in this court of record complains of blah, blah, blah. Okay? Now, if you decree, or if you declare that you are one of the people, you are declaring your sovereignty. You don't have to say you're sovereign. You automatically are. If you're not sovereign, then you're not one of the people. If you're a citizen, that's something else, okay? So by declaring, by accusing, the plaintiff accuses himself of being a sovereign when he says he accuses himself of being one of the people. He doesn't have to prove it. Someone else, if they want to say he's not sovereign, would have to prove that he's not. The burden is always on the other party. But you can accuse yourself of anything, and you don't have to prove it. It's the other way around. You only have to prove something when it affects someone else. Okay? So, um, he, he declares right up front, he's one of the people. Okay? That defines sovereignty automatically, based on the prior things that I explained. Then he says, in this court of record, he complains of blah, blah, blah. You see, if you're the sovereign, you make the rules, right? You decree the law. And if you decree the law, he's saying he, what the form is. It's like the king is in his castle, and he's bringing in the subject defendant for, to answer to an accusation. You see? And when he's in his own castle, he defines his own castle. He defines his own form. In this case, he chose the form that's called a court of record. I'm one of the people, and in this form called the court of record, I'm complaining of this. Now, why did he pick the court of record, those three words, court of record, as his form? Because the Constitution of the United States specifically says and a court of record has five requirements. It keeps a record of the proceedings. That's number one. Number four has power to find or imprison for contempt. Those two, number one and number four, is what you find in Black's Law Dictionary, fifth edition or later. Okay? But if you go to Black's fourth edition, you find there's three more requirements. One of them is that it generally has a seal. That means it's optional. You may or may not have a seal but it is proceeding according to the common law, okay? That's a court of record. If you're not proceeding according to the common law, then you're not a court of record. So when the sovereign, when the plaintiff said, and in this court of record complains of such and such, he automatically said, we're proceeding according to the common law because that's what a court of record is. And by the way, if you look at the Constitution of California, the 1879 version, that's the second one. It says right in Article 6, Paragraph 1 of the California Constitution that all the courts in California are courts of record. No statutes. No codes. Okay? So why do they use statutes and codes? Because you agree to it. I won't go into it in detail now, but the arraignment process, the purpose of arraignment is to get you to abandon a court of record and go into a special court called a criminal court. But you don't have to go into that court. You can say, no, I want a court of record. You've got to prosecute according to the common law if you're going to prosecute. You can demand that. Now, if you make that demand, uh, you better well have the knowledge to back up the the demand. So I'm not telling you to do that until you know what you're doing. But I'm giving you a hint, and that is that that whole arraignment process is the process of stripping you of your sovereignty and getting contracting you into an alternative court system. Because how can they do that? Well, one of your rights is the right to contract. So they can engage you in contract. That's what the arraignment process is, contracting you. 
Okay, so that's how we select the form. We say in this court of record. So does that answer your question about sovereignty in the court? Now one more cute little thing. Number two, the tribunal is independent of the magistrate. What's a magistrate? A magistrate is basically anybody who is on the government payroll. The governor is a magistrate. The judges are magistrates. If you look specifically in the penal code, I think it's section 808 maybe, I believe it's 808, it says that all the judges of the superior court are magistrates. In fact, all the judges are magistrates. Municipal court, superior court, appellate court, and supreme court. They're all magistrates. Now, if you have a court of record, which is what the California Constitution says, all courts are court of record, and if they are all magistrates, and if the tribunal is independent of the magistrate, then who's the tribunal? Well, you got 12 of them in a jury, and if you have no jury, the tribunal is the plaintiff. That's the one who does the judging. You see it all the time in traffic court, okay? In traffic court, who's the accuser? It's the state, right? Got a state employee out there. Probably works for the city, maybe. But the point is, is it's the state power that's there, okay? So the accuser is the state. Then who prosecutes it? The state. Who judges it? The state. And who carries out the judgment once we arrive at the judgment? It's the state. Well, see, if you have no jury, then the plaintiff is the tribunal. Okay? So when you bring your court case, you want to be sure that you specify that you are one of the people and that you're in a court of record. And that way you block out the judge from making any decisions. That's exactly why it is I'm able to issue an order vacating a judge's judgment, because I own that court. Does make sense? Everybody keeping up with me as to why, or, or am I bragging too much? Okay. Yes? Sure. Does this work now? It, it is so rumored. <laughs> um, the difference between um, being a citizen mm -hmm. and being sovereign, is it, or being people? Yes, they are different. Right? Yeah. Um, but one of the things you talked about was naturalization. That's not being a right. citizen, right? Well, if you naturalize, mm -hmm. you contract in for a citizenship. Okay, because I'm a resident, I'm a uh -huh. uh, resident alien, I'm Canadian, mm -hmm. sure. I never became a citizen. Mm -hmm. Is it Canada a republic? Yes. Then you may be one of the people of Canada, is that possible? Yeah. Well, then you're a visiting sovereign, I think. I believe you are. Okay. I'd like to think you are. Okay. <laughs> All right, I was just wanting to understand naturalized. Yeah, um, now look, there's, a, um, there's an important point here, when you go to court, Always remember our great leader and president, Abraham Lincoln, because he was a lawyer. And he said, if you don't want to argue a point, don't bring it up. Okay? Now, when you're in court, you, you, you have your enemy out there, okay? I mean, uh, this legal stuff basically is civilized warfare, okay? And so when you go to court, uh, they have the same problem you do. I mean, they don't know everything. They, you know, they've got this, they, they have their problems. And if you read their papers, the more you know, the more you realize they have their problems. We've got a case going now where we're suing four judges, six prosecutors, and five public defenders who didn't do their job or did their jobs when they were told they weren't welcome. Okay? And every one of them is coming back with demurs. Every demurs. Yeah. Well, watch out. That's a beautiful word that a lot of people attach to. But I'll tell you what a demur is. You see, when you get sued, you get accused of all sorts of things. You get accused the facts, 
That's, the, that's in your accusation. Their facts are there, and the law is there. You violated the law, and I want my, my uh, compensation out of you for the injuries you caused. That's what a lawsuit is, okay? A demur is half an answer, because in a normal answer, you'd come back and you say, no, those facts are wrong, or that law is wrong, and these laws apply, and these are the other facts that really happen. That's what you normally would do in an answer on a lawsuit. But in a demur, a demur is law only. You talk about law. So in the accusation, I talk about facts and law. But when I answer, I also talk about facts and law. But if I demur, I only talk about law. Now, you know what's terrible about that? You're, when you do a demur, you are automatically saying all the facts are true. So here we are, we're accusing these judges of violating the rights, we're accusing the judges of, of um, uh, not answering when an objection is raised to jurisdiction, they just wrote over it, ignored it. They did a demur, that means, yeah, that's right, that's what we did. So this should be a very interesting lawsuit. We're in process right now. But so don't ever ha let anybody sucker you into a demur unless you really do so intentionally because you are agreeing to all the facts that the other person accused you of if that's if you're demurring to their accusation okay so watch out for demurs and all the attorneys do them by the way and I'll tell you another little secret point it really isn't so secret you'll see it in Bouvier's law dictionary but when you do a demur the court then rules on the demur. That means the tribunal. Okay? They rule on the demur. And at that point, the court now has the discretion. The court can either allow the process to go on and have a trial, or the court could decide to go straight to judgment. Well, we sued these judges, and these judges all demurred. And guess what? We're going to go straight to judgment. <laughs> because the plaintiff is a tribunal. They never ask for a jury. <laughs> now, you see, it's such a simple thing, and yet the judges themselves made that mistake. They're demurring. Why would they demur and, and admit that everything we said was true? <laughs> I suspect, yeah, it sounds like it'd be kind of French. French. Now watch out for French words, because sometimes they become very much like English and can fool you, okay? I think it was Br President Bush, the, the present President Bush. He's quoted as having said, the trouble with the French is that they don't have a word for entrepreneur. <laughs> <laughs> no comment. <laughs> okay, well, I guess that uh, um, this is why it's important to know it's a republic. I, it's important, kind of going over it a little bit. First of all, you have to know the difference between a people and a citizen. People are sovereign, citizens operate by privilege only, granted by their masters, whoever the masters may be, in this case the United States government or the, the state. That's the two points. And we covered uh, democracy versus republic. If you're in a democracy, again, you're under privilege. When you're in a democracy, you go into court, all the laws, whatever it is, are mandatory, and you must obey whatever the judge tells you. The judge is both the tribunal and also the magistrate. And so because of that, as a citizen, you're subject to everything, and you know what the results are. If it's a republic, and you're in your sovereign capacity, you open up your court, you borrow their warehouseman. Who's their warehouseman? Their warehouseman has a name. He's called the clerk of the court, and he warehouses your papers that you, quote, file in. Okay? So you borrow their staff to do everything, and now you have your own court system, and you run your own court. And, but that is why it's important to understand that this is a republic 
and not a democracy because once you understand that difference, you can now speak with strength, you can run your court because you are king. And don't ever let that go. So, everybody happy with what I said so far? Or is there any questions? That's it? Okay. Thank you, sir. Okay, uh, Bill, thanks very much. Uh, one, uh, before we close here, since we have to be out of here, actually we're supposed to be out by 1030, but if uh, you would help us stack these chairs up along the, uh, along the sides here. And, uh, and also the tables. Thank you very much, and uh, we look forward to seeing you next time. And our next speaker is Galen Ross. Galen Ross, speaking on uh, the elite, all those elites that are always with us, it seems. So he apparently has some new information on what the dastardly elites have uh, in store for us next. Thank you. Good night.